you know, we talk about twin pandemics. <laughs> and um, not just the pandemic of COVID, the pandemic of racism, uh, especially as it's manifested itself in the United States. <laughs> Tell me how you reacted, um, how you felt um, when all of the things began to happen around uh, the killing of George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, and others. Yeah. Um... It was as if, um, this will be dramatic and violent, but as if um, an ice pick were being um, plunged into my body um, multiple times because it was happening uh, so close together. Um, and over the last uh, six or eight years, um, even going back to the um, uh, incident uh, where George Zimmerman, you know, uh, killed the uh, young man, um, it's like, um, Black life um, not only doesn't matter to some people, uh, but uh, when it doesn't, when something and someone doesn't matter, it becomes or they become expendable. Um, there's a phrase in the book of Job, and I know I'm lifting it out of the text, but there's um, a place where uh, Job is described as being um, one with no name in the streets. And um, I feel that way uh, at times uh, as uh, a person of ebony hue, as a black man, as an African-American uh, here in the, uh, in the United States. And, and that is said fully in the context of um, having um, had um, uh, a broad opportunity and privilege of serving um, in a predominantly um, white institution. Though I, it, it is uh, incumbent upon me to say, um, not an institution that started off all white uh, or as largely white as it is now in the United States. And, and uh, I think uh, Methodist historians would uh, concur with that. So it's, it's been hugely painful. The, the other part of that pain is, I mean, I've, I've felt um, you know, reasonably safe, but I've taken some extra precautions. Uh, none of the, all of them of a nonviolent nature. And uh, so I don't intend to arm myself uh, in any way. So that's not the intimation um, here. But, um, you know, I, I've watched over time, and this is not new to just the George Floyd um, assassination era, but, you know, if I, if I happen to go into my bank in the neighborhood where, um, I bank and I'm, I have to be going in um, when I'm coming from the gym or on the way to the gym. I've got a sweatsuit on or even gym shorts and a top. And, um, you know, uh, never been mistreated. Let me let me be clear. But there's a sort of an almost uh, perfunctory, can we help you, sir? If I go in in my suit and tie, much less in my clerical, uh, because it's on for other reasons, they're genuflecting. <laughs> it's like, you know, stumbling over themselves. So, so that kind of idea that you get treated differently based on your appearance, I am not suggesting that may not happen to other demographics. I'm saying I know it happens to people of color. I know it happens to black people. Let me be deeply, deeply, um, deeply uh, specific. And um, so um, the other thing is I, I worry for my, you know, I've got a 38 year old son, Cynthia and I, and um, you know, I shouldn't be worried that if he gets stopped, um, and rightly so, if if you know his tail light is out or something like that, um, you know, I, I want I want him to have the same opportunity uh, that he gets to go home that night, and um, that he's um, you know he doesn't wake up dead. Um, to 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 paraphrase, um, so so that's that's that that's the anxiety that that many many people of color, uh, black and brown in particular, uh, carry carry with them, and it's just utterly ridiculous. Um, uh, this is a 400 plus year old virus. Uh, it is not unknown. It has a name. Um, it appears only to have gone dormant in certain seasons, but it has never been dormant in the history of America pre um, a, a constitution uh, and a declaration of independence and even now. That's probably a little more than you wanted, but that's what editing is for. <laughs> so help me envision um, in all that you've said, and you've said a lot, help me to envision the church's response what would you um, 
what would you hope the church would do? How, how, how should the church respond? Uh, my hope is that our church, I, I, would, I, think this, I think this is true for all churches, but um, the place where you and I have any influence uh, is among United Methodists, uh, is that we would uh, clear our throats and um, uh, bring this conversation anew uh, to center stage in the life of the church. It's already center stage in the life of the culture. It does not mean that there are not other important uh, isms and sins of society that need to be addressed um, concurrently. So I don't, uh, there's a huge um, uh, intersectionality to a, to a lot of this. Um, but people have raised the question, if we had managed in the United Methodist Church, for example, the conversation of race differently and really followed through on uh, our, our preachments and our teachings and what's in our book of discipline, might we have been uh, better able to manage other conversations about the isms and phobias uh, that have uh, bedeviled us? Uh, Gil Caldwell is one who kept raising that philosophical, theological question. Um, maybe because we demurred on this, uh, which has been with us from the beginning, um, we, we, we will be in the position of continuing to demure on a clarion call, a distinct bugle sound, uh, that we not only stand uh, for um, uh, uh, the elimination of racism in all the aspects uh, uh, of our lives. Now, it's one thing to speak at a denominational level, and I'm not suggesting that we've spoken that strongly. But if you look at our book of discipline, there's some good things there. So I want to affirm that. Uh, annual conferences have made some good statements. Uh, from time to time, um, the agencies and the Council of Bishops have, have done that. But, but we've not stayed consistently denominationally on point. And so it is no wonder to me that um, um, in, in some communities, in local churches, um, uh, there is reactivity to, for example, this, this phrase, Black Lives Matter. I mean, we should all be able to say that without choking on it and without diluting it to, to then have all these other categories. Of course, all lives matter. It, it is insane um, to not be able to bring a focus to where real pain is um, at, a, at a particular time. It does not undermine the mattering of all lives and of other specific uh, de demographics. So um, what local congregations can do um, and what annual conferences and the denominations should be doing is providing resourcing and equipping, first by keeping the conversation going Secondly, by making strategic systemic decisions that embody what happens in those conversations. And then saying what we say in everything, every community and every local church can step into this conversation. And, um, um, and, and, and we would step into it more effectively if we weren't so segregated in our congregations. But that may be another, another subject. That's a whole nother interview. Uh, let, let me ask you, you mentioned that had we not demurred, and as you say that, I am thinking that you are speaking of um, the creation of the central jurisdiction. Can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we talk often of the, um, the so-called reunion of, um, of 1939. Uh, in Methodist Protestant, Methodist Episcopal, and Methodist Episcopal South, and what was a huge political compromise, a huge political compromise to get the union, um, so to speak, or the, the reunion. And it was done on the backs of, of African Americans. But I want to say that when we constitutionalized segregation, understanding that not every Black American United Methodist was in a church, uh, and even a historically black church that was in the central jurisdiction, but the majority uh, were, uh, that when we constitutionalized it, we codified it, which means it, it, to get it out took two thirds or more of a, of a vote, you with me? Um, and uh, when, we, when we codified it, we, we actually took, uh, took a step back, not 
that our separations uh, were not themselves a step back uh, from the gospel and from the earliest best aspirations of of, of the uh, of the uh, of the Methodist movement, and um, and so that history that legacy is still with us. And in fact, this is this is my opinion as a United Methodist that the fact that the jurisdictional lines are still there is a daily reminder to this United Methodist that we are not free of that demon um, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, racialized uh, Methodism, United Methodism uh, of segregation. And within the borders of those jurisdictions, some of the jurisdictions that most advocated, <laughs> most advocated that this is the only way they could come into the so-called reunion um, are in some ways um, still parts of the church uh, that believe they're running things. And what you're, what you're talking about is just the creation of not just the central jurisdictions, but the creation of jurisdictions, period. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. a way to segregate. Um, could you say more specifically for people who don't know their history, uh, why, why were jurisdictions created? So r roughly hewn that when um, the reunion or union was being negotiated, um, and, and that conversation sort of uh, got consummated uh, in, the, in the late 30s, uh, it was roughly speaking the matter of, would there ever be bishops that looked like me <laughs> or looked like you, uh, uh, Kanitha, um, that would end up presiding over um, uh, Anglo sisters and brothers in certain parts of the church. And it was simply uh, not conceivable uh, for some of our sisters and brothers, uh, meaning our predecessors, that they could conceive that that a black Episcopal leader would be um, have authority uh, in that way in the life of the church under the Book of Discipline uh, over their lives, uh, their itineration, and their congregations. So, in order to, uh, it, it, there are all sorts of layers uh, that church historians could could tease out, but that would be, I would say, sort of the big rock uh, that that fills uh, fills the jar. How can we make sure uh, that there's not too much mixing and mingling and if you folks up there want to mix and mingle uh it, it's all right but uh, don't impose that uh on us uh it, it's not dissimilar to what happened with the desegregation of it uh, uh, segregation and desegregation issues related to uh, public education i mean this is a story a narrative that's been rehearsed over and over again and again i i uh, apologize that this is too american uh but in the uh in the u.s uh, the u.s context thank you thank you that's really helpful uh as i think especially for those who don't know uh don't know the history uh, in the ways that you do, and you bring such experience and such eloquence to that explanation.